Well, hi there. My name is Clint Laidlaw. I have a PhD in biology as well as a master's degree and an undergraduate degree in biology and zoology. I run a biology outreach called Clint's Reptile Room in Springville, Utah. This summer we'll be doing our second year of biology summer camps called Clint's Reptile Academy, this time for ages five and up. That, that includes you adults. We'll have a link to the registration in the description. I'm a university instructor, at least when I have time, and an online instructor of animal biology here on the YouTube channel Clint's Reptiles, which is where you are right now. And a few months ago, I ventured into the societal poison that is TikTok for the first time. And just today, by the way, someone asked me if I was sure that TikTok was a poison and not a venom on society, which was a great question. It is a poison because we have to consume it. It isn't injected into us. Anyway, I recently consumed this poison for the first time and you guys loved it. So today, we are returning to the abyss that is TikTok. And uh, Mr. Jason, what have we today? Uh, today we have four categories. Okay. Crazy animal encounters, unidentified animals. Nice. Cryptozoology, and because you love them, sharks. Shark, I'm wearing my shark tie today. There you go. Okay, so what's first? Uh, we're gonna start with crazy animal encounters. With each one, if you could give us some idea of what is going on, okay. what it is, what it is doing, and how much danger the people in the video are in. Okay. My heart is beating so fast. I think that's a whale tail. It's just come up and stuck its tail up and it's not going anywhere. I, I don't even know what to say. I'm jacking up. What the f I don't want to get too close. I cannot. This is the craziest thing that's ever happened. The transparent kayak is making the whales act so weird. It's just come up and put its tail up in the air like that. It's not even, it's not even, I don't even know what to say anymore. Oh, and the little baby's just swimming around it. Is it, ah, ah, look at it. That's a huge whale tail right in front of me. Okay, um, so uh, the first thing, that has nothing to do with the transparent kayak. Um, what that is, that, that looks to be a humpback whale. In fact, I'm pretty sure of it because you could see the baby has very long pectoral fins. Uh, and it's sleeping. Uh, whales have voluntary breathing. We, you know, we, we as humans, we can breathe voluntarily or involuntarily. Uh, so you can decide to breathe or your body will just breathe and, and you'll breathe all night. Whales, when they sleep, they will drown if they're breathing involuntarily. And so they have to surface and deliberately breathe. But, but when they sleep, they just hold their breath and they will often sit there sort of near the surface. They've got some types of like hemispherical sleep. So parts of their brain can be asleep at a given time and they can still surface like that. And, and these are, these are some really cool things too. So like that baby you could see was awake. They can't hold their breath for quite as long as the mom. And, and they even have trouble swimming long distances and stuff. They'll actually ride in the mom's slipstream as, and, and they can be asleep in the slipstream while mom is, is swimming away, which is pretty tremendous. Oh, and uh, no danger or virtually no danger. I mean, I suppose the whale could wake up and accidentally slap you with its tail, but unlikely. Today's video is sponsored by Ridge. By now you know I've been carrying a Ridge wallet for years and I've really, really liked my first one because I've actually had a whole bunch of different ones that I've carried at different times now was the Forged Carbon and I still love that one. It's still one of my favorite ones, but uh, some of you know that I love Hyperlime. And now there is a carbon hyperlime. It's got kind of secret ninja hyperlime hidden in the sides and right there. And then it has all the things I liked so much about my original Ridge wallet, which is still holding up great to this day because that's how they do. And Ridge is celebrating their 11 year anniversary with a very special sale. This is the biggest sale I can remember. If you go to ridge.com slash Clint, you will save 30% on your order until April 1st. 
People come in here to Clint's Reptile Room all the time and they want to show me their Ridge wallet because, well, they love them so much. I love mine, they know that, and there's so much variety in Ridge wallets now that you never see two that are the same. And if you think the Ridge wallet might be the right wallet for you, but you're not entirely sure, well, right now you can save 30%. I've never seen a sale like that before. And if at any point in the next 365 days, which in a normal year would be a whole year, you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund, thanks to their 365 day risk-free trial. Plus it's guaranteed for life. I've never seen them offer 30% off before. So if you've ever considered getting a Ridge product of any kind, now is the time. Just make sure you go to ridge.com slash Clint. Now let's get back to the video. At your feet. Oh my God. No. All right, so uh, that is a big bull alligator. Um, that, given the way that it approached them, it's probably a bull alligator that is used to receiving food scraps from humans. So it came right up to their boat and came up just expecting food. As far as how much danger they're in, uh, definitely some. Uh, you know, that, that alligator's probably not coming up there to attack them, but it's very startling. He, he put his hand on the top of the alligator's snout, which, I mean, if you know what you're doing, you can do that and you can push that jaw closed and you can you could potentially shove it off but if you do that move wrong and, and you know and, and say get it a little bit on the side you know alligators will snap sideways very quickly and once it grabs your hand I mean any any number of terrible things yeah it could it could start rolling and absolutely rip your arm off it could drag you into the water and there'd probably be nothing that anybody there could do about it so that was potentially a life-threatening situation though Alligators attack very, very few people, given how many alligators there are in especially high traffic areas like in Florida and other parts of the southeastern United States. Maybe not as much danger as you would think, but definitely some danger there. We've actually got a whole video on a pretty bad alligator bite that happened to one of our friends, Lindsay Bull, and uh, you can check that out here if you want to see that. Right there, right there, right there. Come on, Mike. Come on. Mike. Come on. 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 Come Oh, man. Mike, get on this, Mike. Mike, 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 he barely got you. It's not even barely got you. Holy. Okay. Uh, so that was some real danger. Um, you know, the, the, the alligator people before, like maybe they didn't need to touch that alligator, but that was a pretty reasonable response to having a big old bull alligator pop out of the water onto your boat. Uh, don't do this. This, is, this, isn't, this isn't a good idea. That is a big black bear. Black bears, Males can get over 500 pounds in, in rare instances. Uh, I don't think this one was that big, but that is a good sized male black bear. Fortunately, that black bear never showed any signs of aggression. Not even when it swiped him was that much aggression. It was just sort of like, what are you doing? And because that, that bear could have just absolutely destroyed that guy if it would have wanted to. Um, I mean, you know, if it, if it had decided to maul him to death, I don't think there's anything anybody there was going to do to stop it. It was, you know, it was just going to kill him. And, uh, you know, black bears are not known to be the most aggressive of bears. They're smaller for bears. But, I mean, American black bears have killed 
I think like 67 people since 1900. So like they do kill people from time to time. And uh, I mean, you know, if a, bear, if a bear comes into your yard, maybe I'm just going to throw this out there. Uh, get out of your yard for a while. Uh, you, like, you, don't, you don't need to be like, hey, bear. Let me show you the exit. Uh, don't do that. That's a, that's a good way to die. <laughs> don't let the door hit you in the butt. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. That bear is just sort of like, what are you doing? <laughs> I know how to lead. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I could get this puny gate open on my own. Oh, man. If that bear would have stood up. Like that game would have changed in a hurry. Uh, that bear was being extremely understanding. That bear didn't really want to be there anyway. And it's like, yes, I'm going. I'm going. Okay. Yeah, just knock it off. I'm going. <laughs> he was fortunate. That's all it was. That could have been real bad. Don't do that. So that was that was a guy with a huge looks to be a male saltwater crocodile. And this is going to sound crazy, but I will tell you that he was in very little danger. At the same time, I will also tell you if you ever spot a saltwater crocodile or any sort of crocodile or any sort of large crocodilian and you go down and do any of that, you will be seriously injured or killed. Guaranteed. The reason why I he wasn't in danger is, I mean, you can see very clearly that that is an extremely socialized crocodile. Now, I'm not saying it's a captive crocodile. I've, I've actually seen a lot of videos and, and situations like this. This is actually not all that common, uh, not all that uncommon, where you have these big socialized male saltwater crocodiles in villages in areas within their ranges. This is a really, really smart animal. You got to recognize that. Uh, one thing that shows you how how used to people that animal is and how well socialized it's been. He's splashing in the water right in front of its face, right next to its face. Okay. At times he's splashing in the water right next to that crocodile and he's not even looking at the crocodile. And you got to you got to recognize that crocodiles are covered head to toe in what are called ISOs, integumentary sensory organs. Uh, they're also sometimes called DPRs, dome pressure receptors. On alligators, they've pretty much just got them on their head. On crocodiles, from the tip of the snout to the end of the tail, they've got these ISOs. And they are their mechanoreceptors, their thermoreceptors, their chemosensory receptors. They, they pick up all of that. They detect every bit of that moving and that splashing that's going on and they are very, very wired to react to that splashing. If, if you ever are in an area where there are crocodilians and you start splashing around on the surface, they'll start coming to you. And you know, and if they, they detect movement with those ISOs next to their head, like instinctively they snap. He's doing all of that right next to, the, you know, he's got food it looked like in his hand, like it's detecting all of this but it knows to wait until he feeds it. And, you know, and that's, that's a huge amount of work that the people in that village have been doing with that specific animal. It's really cool 
I mean, not, not only is that an amazing thing just to be able to witness and what an experience that would be to have a bond like that with a saltwater crocodile, but it's even really good for the villages and things because that male tends to keep out all of the other large saltwater crocodiles from the area. He is, he is the dude. And so the, the waterways become much safer for all of the people because the crocodile that patrols them, that dominates that area, like he, he knows the people, the people know him. They know how to act around him. He knows how to act around them. It's an incredible thing. It's an incredible thing. Again, don't ever try that. Don't ever try to do that. But you can see just how intelligent these animals are. They're very, very smart. They're not just instinctive killing machines. They're thoughtful, intelligent animals. Okay, uh, we're gonna switch gears. The next category is unidentified animal identification. All right. So tell us what the heck we're looking at. All right, let's do it. That's what's called a muntjac deer. They're from Asia. There's also, I think, a really big invasive population in England. They've got little antlers, very small. Like, I don't know if you can see there, they're really tiny. They, they primarily fight with tusks. So they're a tusked deer, though they're not super closely related to some of the other tusked deer that are out there. Tusks are actually fairly common in deer. Uh, and those wild things that are opening and closing, those are scent glands on their face. Uh, they've got some in front of their eyes and farther up and they can open them and they tend to rub them on things Anyway, that gives them quite a wild a wild look All right, so that is uh, a basket star, which is a type of echinoderm, like um, brittle stars. In fact, I think that is a type of brittle star, uh, uh, sea stars, these sorts of things. Um, they, they're, they're a brittle star, but with multiple branching arms. So the arms will branch and then the branches will branch. And, and like all echinoderms, I'm not, I'm not sure what the status is of their tube feet. They've probably got them. So other, other echinoderms would be things like, like um, sea urchins, uh, like sea cucumbers, these sorts of things. And, and they've generally got tube feet. They're, they have a hydrovascular system. So they don't, they don't have a, a blood circulatory system. They, they, they move stuff around with water and they, they can pressurize uh, the little tubes and stuff in order to move their tube feet. Anyway, they're, they're a really crazy organism with pentaradial symmetry, though as juveniles, they have bilateral symmetry. They're actually part of the bilateria. And interestingly enough, um, it, if you look at the, the phylogeny of animals, of, of the uh, invertebrates, they are among the closest relatives of the vertebrates, which is pretty wild. What the f is that? Ah, get away, get away. What the f is this? No, 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 no. Is it dead? I think it's fucking dead. Okay, just a... Ma! Ma! Ah, the f is it moving? Ah! What the f is that thing? It's a f bear! It's got the fucking virus! It's alive! Ma! Call a fucking cop! Ma! Get the fucking gun! Get away with me! 
Stop it! Ah! What did you do? What the f? What the f is that? It's a f it's a f dinosaur! Mom, call a cop! Um, so. I kind of bet that's not the original audio, just because those are from, like, Southeast Asia, and that guy doesn't sound like he is. But um, that is a flying lemur. There, there are two species of flying lemurs. They're not actually lemurs. They're from uh, the order Dermoptera. We actually talked about them a little bit in our video on the primates from last month. Um, like like many of the, the basal primates, they have a tooth comb. Uh, they can glide. You saw, you saw they've got their, their limbs all sort of webbed together like a flying squirrel. They can glide more than 200 feet, uh, sometimes upwards of like 500 feet. They're not actually flying. They're, they're falling with style like Buzz Lightyear, but they will lose very little altitude as they glide in many cases. They are eutherian mammals, which means they've got a chorioallantoic placenta, um, but they are born super altricial, like marsupials. So they, they come out really, really underdeveloped. And the female makes what's called a quasi-pouch using her tail and her gliding membrane to form essentially like a marsupial's pouch. Anyway, this particular one looks to me like it's caught on some sort of fishing line. Um, I really don't know what what's going on exactly, but it's kind of a sad video, I think. Uh, so look at, like right at first, I thought that those were going to be fish or maybe squid. Um, but I think what they are is, uh, they're, they're polychaete worms, which are, they're closely related to earthworms. These are, these are marine worms, something different. I actually want to do a full video on the Annelida, uh, because segmented worms are generally quite a bit different looking than earthworms are, even though earthworms are one. For one thing, they have way more defined heads. Uh, they've usually got pretty awesome jaws, and in fact, I think the jaws on on those particular polychaete worms, I think they're like made out of zinc or some sort of metal. Anyway, crazy. And they've also got these large appendages called parapodia, which in in a lot of the polychaete worms like those, when they go into a breeding swarm, which is what's going on there, if the parapodia grow considerably and they because during most of the time they spend more time down in the bottom but they come up and they swim around um sort of like the way that earthworms do when it rains in the spring or something they come out and i'm not sure about this but earthworms tend to be hermaphrodites and so those might be as well i'm just not sure about that but anyway uh a swarm of worms <laughs> Okay, uh, so that was a bittern, uh, which is a type of heron. H herons, I don't know if you've seen birds like uh, great blue herons. I recently saw tricolored herons. And, and you can distinguish them from birds like cranes most easily when they fly, because they pull their head back like this, and so they sit with their head not sticking way out at the end of their neck. They've got long necks, but uh, they, they stick them back like this, and, and so do bitterns. Bitterns are really weird, you know, they're, they're more cryptically colored and more reclusive than a lot of other herons. And I don't know if you notice how cool their, their coloration is. When they're first afraid, you know, if they see something they think is concerning, what they do is they stand perfectly still with their head pointed straight up in the air. And it just kind of looks like reeds because of the striping and they'll kind of sway in the breeze a little bit. And it's only if that doesn't work that they throw on that big, they'll puff up all their feathers and they bring their wings down and they just look enormous and crazy wild. Uh, but yeah, just a bittern. Just a creepy looking bittern. Just a creepy looking bittern.
I think that what that is is a Deepsteria jellyfish. Uh, this is this is a, a type of jellyfish from the deep sea, and I guess it's fairly common for for deep sea jellyfish in general. But they don't have any tentacles; they just trap prey inside of their big old bell. And so, and that bell, that that it's not as big as it looked there. Like that looks like that's like. I don't know, 15 feet across. They're like two feet across, so I think it was just kind of close to the camera. But but anyway, they'll they'll wrap their 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 bell around prey. Interestingly enough, too, they've got symbiotic isopods that live in the bell as well, which is kind of bodacious. I feel like the music didn't really fit. It's so graceful <laughs> and elegant. Obviously, this world is full of some really cool animals, and oftentimes we don't even know what they are. Like things you've never seen. And and that's one of the things I most enjoy is going out into the world and finding things I never even knew existed. That was one of the things I loved so much about going to South America was going out into the Amazon rainforest and being like, I know there's some animals here that I've seen before, but just discovering how many incredible things there were that I'd never seen in my life and then getting to share those things with you. And I want to do that all over the world. Now that trip was made possible due to the support of our patrons on Patreon. And if you would like to see us do that some more, please consider supporting us so we can. Okay, we have a few more of those to do, uh, but I want to pause for a moment to do a bit of cryptozoology. I was excited when I heard about that. Uh, we'll get back to the unidentified animal identification at the end. Uh, but right now I have a couple of different cryptids for you. Uh, I want to know if you have heard of it before, what you think is going on in the videos, and do you think that this creature might actually exist? Okay. Since the late 1800s, there have been talks of dinosaurs in the Congo, and one in particular catches many people's eye. Mokele and Bembe, which roughly translates to one who stops the flow of the river, has been spotted basically for over the past 150 years in uh, rural parts of, well, rural is <laughs> understating it, but Lake Telly in Africa. Now over the years, multiple sightings have happened and there have been multiple expeditions to find Mokele and Bembe, but none of them have produced any real evidence besides, you know, a couple of grainy pictures. This is one of those stories that has been talked about for so long that you, you gotta think there's some sort of truth behind it. And I would like to believe there is, but there hasn't been any evidence to show that this is a real animal. Lake Telly is also so far removed from civilization in the outreaches of the Congo, you never know. So yeah, I have heard of this one before, Mokele and Bembe. Uh, I first heard of it when I was a little kid. My, my favorite, or one of my favorite things was a, a video it starred Christopher Reeves, and it was about dinosaurs. And we rented it from the library so many times that eventually I got my own copy uh, of this video. I, I, I found it on YouTube, actually, not too long ago. It is, I, I still enjoy the heck out of it. And they, they talked about them there. What I understand of it is it's like a, a small sauropod, small sauropod dinosaur that's supposed to be way out in the Congo. Like you said there, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of hard evidence that that it really is a sauropod. I've heard I've heard people say that it might be black rhinoceroses, which used to live in that area that people were seeing and, and talking about. But I mean of all the places where something can go undetected for a long time, the Congo is definitely one of those places. I know I know um, things like Okapis and and mountain gorillas you know, they were out, you know, in these remote parts of Africa. The Okapi is at the very least, I think, I think maybe the mountain gorillas as well. Like a lot of people were like, you know, just thought that was all crazy and just rumors, you know, the locals telling wild stories and then, well, oh, oh, turns out they were absolutely right. That said, you know, if, if you look at mountain gorillas, like mountain gorillas, yeah, we didn't know there were mountain gorillas, but we knew there were gorillas. Okapis, at first we didn't know what they were, but you know, they're giraffes. And we know about other giraffes. What we don't have any evidence of at all for the last 66 million years would be any extant sauropods at all. And so 
if there is a lineage of sauropods surviving in the Congo, there isn't any evidence of them that we have found anywhere else for a very, very long time. Uh, not impossible, not impossible. Things we thought were extinct turned out not to be extinct. Not, I wouldn't say with some regularity, but it does happen. And so it would be the heck of a thing, but I will be very pleasantly surprised if there are dinosaurs in the Congo that aren't birds. So that was one. Looks like you had a couple more. Yep. Are these all from Utah? I think so. Before we get to the last one, I want to give a couple of thoughts about uh, about those two. So that first one I saw a few months ago, I think it was just from like last year, and I am not I am not closed off to the possibility that there is a species of ape more human-like than chimpanzees and bonobos out there somewhere alive still. They've certainly existed in the past and not nearly as distant of a past as sauropod dinosaurs. And so, you know, if, if things like okapis that maybe aren't really even trying to avoid us all that much and aren't nearly as intelligent as we are, were able to avoid us for most of, most of uh, human history, at least most of Western history, you know, it's possible. I think I, I, you know, I can give some explanations for what else those first two videos could be. So that one that looks like it's filmed like through a spotting scope up on the mountain. I mean, that that is something walking. Well, OK, I'll, I'll be clear. Both of those are just videos of Dave Kaufman. That's probably the most likely explanation. But <laughs> you, can see, you can see they walk somewhat in a somewhat human like gait, uh, much like Dave and uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, seriously though, that first one is moving very quickly in the snow, which unless that video has been sped up, which it doesn't look to me like it has, you know, the, the, uh, it, it's not, it's not so much that it's moving quickly. It's that it's moving so effortlessly over the snow. So my best explanation for what that one would be, if not a Bigfoot maybe a snowshoer, maybe a really big Dave Kaufman like snowshoer up there, you know, snowshoes are going to facilitate much easier movement, you know, but that, that is, that is some interesting footage. The second one, again, I'm not, I'm not, uh, ignoring the possibility that it could be a Bigfoot. Uh, other fairly likely explanations. It could be a black bear standing on two legs. It could also be a hoax. A guy, you know, I, the first one doesn't look like a hoax. It's, it looks like, they spotted something, you know, it'd be hard even if you were wearing like a monkey suit to move like that, unless you're a snowshoer. Uh, I think, I'd, you know, I'd really have to get a long, hard look and have, you know, I'd need to watch some snowshoers and how they move, but it's moving fast. 
Uh, second one, you know, it could easily be just a person in a suit out there. You don't ever get a great look at it, but it's interesting. That's interesting. All right, let's see the last one. So yeah, I guess all of these come from Utah, I think. So, and like, right there. I, uh, so, so, which is exciting. That one, the first two, I think they could either be Bigfoot or something else. Not necessarily a hoax. That one looks like it's either the real deal or it's somebody trying to look like the real deal. It, I, that fur color seems lighter than I'm used to seeing, so maybe they have different different shades. Blends in pretty well. Uh, that, that one is more Chewbacca brown. Yeah, yeah. It almost looked like a, a was it a, like a ghillie suit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but not not entirely. Like the face is not ghillie suitish. All right. Before we get back to unidentified animal identification. Let's take a look at some sharks. I was hoping for sharks. Yeah, let's watch it one more time. Oh boy. That's awesome, isn't it? That that is a that is a Pretty good sized male great white shark bumping a guy in the head with its face. <laughs> and yeah, I, I really, I, I actually, I did, I've seen that one before uh, a few months ago. It's really cool. You know, it, it shows, I think, a lot about what sharks like great white sharks are really all about. One thing that great white sharks virtually never do is eat anybody. They're not really into that. A large percentage of the bites from great white sharks involve people on the surface, often on surfboards. And you know, when a great white shark is down below looking up, it's a silhouette of a sea lion and they attack from below. In, in South Africa, you know, you'll see where they leap all the way out of the water and grab sea lions. And there's not a whole lot of time to assess, you know, you look up there and you're like, that's ah, a sea lion. And you swim up and you nail it. And then once they nail it, they're like, no, nah, that doesn't taste like a sea lion at all. And the problem is, even if you're mistakenly bitten by a great white, like, yeah, it's catastrophic because this is, you know, one of, one of the most powerful bites that you can possibly take. And if, if you're not bitten like that, the way that people are often bitten by sharks is more of an exploratory bite, which is something that totally could have happened there. That, that shark was curious about that diver. And, and on their faces and going down their body, they've got all these little pits. They're sort of similar to the ISOs of of crocodilians, uh, they're ca called Ampulae de Lorenzini, and they, they, they pick up uh, electrical signals as well as, uh, you know, other things, of movement in the water. Anyway, there's a lot of sensory stuff going on in the face of that shark, and that shark was going up and like, what is this guy? What, what is this thing? And it was exploring him, and fortunately, you know, just coming up and bumping into him, that was enough for him to figure out at least that this isn't something he wanted to eat, because a lot of time, and they don't have hands. And so a lot of times, the next thing that they would explore with would be their mouth. And just an exploratory bite from a great white shark, catastrophic. I said they don't eat people because they tend to spit them out. Like if, if they wanted to eat people, they would just eat people. They eat things the size of people all the time. But they, they don't tend to do that. They tend, but sometimes they will bite you just to find out what that was. And uh, I would say that diver <laughs> was extremely lucky. He's alive only because that shark decided not to see what he was all about by tasting him. The bump was uh, good bump. enough. Bump was enough. Right there, wow. Holy crap. <laughs> right there, wow. Holy crap. <laughs> Okay, I, I think I think that was Ocean Ramsey, and uh, who's really an interesting person to follow. Um, I would honestly love to 
spend a day out with sharks with her just to learn the ways that she interacts with, especially tiger sharks, which is what that was. But that was that was an interesting one. What did <laughs> like she takes her head in the water and whoop? Uh, like you can tell she saw it because she starts backing up and and everything. That tiger shark came up and um, tiger sharks seem to be one of those sharks. So tiger sharks, one of the things they specialize on are sea turtles, and so they're uh, you know and they they kind of chase them and stalk them and, and stuff like that. It's really interesting if you see a sea turtle defending itself from a tiger shark because they turn sideways because with their shell sideways, they're gape limited. And so the sharks can't get around the shell if they're if they're sideways to the shark. It is a shark, that, that is maybe a shark that's a little bit more likely to just come up and bite you than is a great white. A, a bite from a tiger shark is not as catastrophic. Like say, say you have a fully grown tiger shark versus a fully grown great white and you're gonna get bitten by one. The tiger shark would be better, but real bad, real bad. And I'd have to look at the statistics, but I, I think a much higher percentage of shark attacks, not that there are very many, but I think tiger sharks are a lot more likely. It's really interesting watching her. She swims with tiger sharks all the time. And it, it, she, I mean, she swam with great whites and stuff too. It's really, you know, when I was a kid, nobody swam with these sharks. It was too dangerous because they will come up and bite you. And so, so people, you know, if you, if you observe these sharks, you did it in a cage. As people have been learning more about their behavior, they've started to interact with them in different ways. And one of the things is, you know, they don't come in in like a hard attack bite. It is just sort of an ex a curious exploratory bite that they seem to do. And so they don't come up on you really fast and you know what they're doing and they just kind of, put their, your, their hand on the shark's rostrum and just kind of push it down in a way. And that's like good enough for the shark. It's like, oh, all right. And as long as you're paying attention, you don't have one come bounce off the back of your head and you do this move right the very first time you try it, you only get two tries to do it wrong. <laughs> but, uh, but, but if you do it right, you know, the first time, like you can interact with these sharks. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> Two seconds, we'll do anything. Get him, get him, get him, get him! We'll do anything. Get him, get him, get him! Okay, so did that say that was in the Everglades? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that's fresh water or, or kind of brackish water where they were. I mean, I get like, I wouldn't think it would be full salt water. I didn't get a great look at it, but I would say your most likely shark that that is, is a bull shark. Bull sharks are, you know, they get way up into fresh water. Uh, they can, they can switch a lot of things with their physiology so they can live in salt water. They can live in fresh water brackish and they get big. I mean, you can keep a bull shark. I think like indefinitely in your pond <laughs> if you, if you live in a place that's warm enough and uh but they get huge they're one of the sharks that attack the most people and they they attack people in weird places one of the stranger things i feel like that any of my professors said during my undergraduate so so the, the, you'll find them way up in the mississippi river you find them way up in the nile and and one of the like i said one of the stranger things any of my professors said is that people often get attacked by bull sharks in the nile because they're up in there and they're just willy-nilly out there because they're not concerned about getting attacked by a shark because why would you expect there to be a shark there and uh, yeah like that's fair i suppose but i don't know who's going willy-nilly into the nile <laughs> like some nile crocodiles hippos that kill more people than all the other african vertebrates combined i just like i don't know who's waiting out there like oh at least there aren't sharks <laughs> but uh yeah, then that one you could see very clearly, sort of like with what, what we were saying with the crocodiles, you know, the, those Ampulae de Lorenzini. He's, he's, look like he's fishing, so he's probably got fish smell on his hands. That's probably actually what he's wash, washing off, is, is some fish, and he's splashing around, and they're very cued into that splashing too, because, you know, sharks, uh, like crocodilians, like they don't waste a lot of time trying to catch stuff that's, you know, like fish that are healthy and swimming around. They're looking for something that's in the water and not doing too well. Having trouble swimming or a fish that's not very healthy, something that's easy to catch. And, and so that kind of struggling and splashing, 
that gets their attention. You certainly don't expect that when you just stick your hands in really quickly. I wouldn't, in the Everglades, I wouldn't willy nilly be putting my hands in the water because uh, I don't suspect there to be any sharks because even if I wasn't worried about sharks, there are a lot of alligators and crocodiles and all kinds of other cool things. Uh, Mechac monkeys with hepatitis. There's a lot of stuff in the Everglades to worry about, uh, but bull sharks potentially are one of those things. And you could see again there, it's one of those situations where it thought it was getting something good as soon as it bit that guy and was like, oh, I, that's not what I thought it was. Let him go. Yikes. <laughs>
All right. So um, that's an owl. That is that is the defensive posture of owls pretty much across the board. Um, like both major owl lineages, they both do that. They both stand like that with their head down and their wings up and they're just looking big and they're clicking their beak. They're just making as much noise as they can, looking as big and scary as they can. And it's pretty effective. I mean, that's a wild looking critter. And it's, it's, uh, it's similar to what we saw earlier with the bittern. That one, as far as what kind of an owl that is, it's, it's some sort of a horned owl, so like it's related to the great horned owl. The its coloration to its facial disc doesn't look to be an a great horned owl. I'm not sure which one it is. Uh, if you know, please let me know. Eventually, I'll, we'll probably do a full phylogeny, maybe of all of the owls, and so I'll, I'll be able to tell you a little more after I've dug into the owls a bit more. What the hell? What is that, Ma? What? Ma, you see this? No. Holy what, what is, the is that? What is happening? Okay. So that is a black sea hare, uh, which is a giant sea slug. Now, the nudibranchs are also often called sea slugs. I'll probably need to dig into all of the gastropods eventually because slug is sort of just a name for like any of them that don't have shells. These are clo more closely related to land snails than they are to the nudibranchs. But they, they are, it's a totally non-dangerous animal. It's, you can, you can pick them up and handle them. Make sure you identify it correctly because there's some crazy stuff in the ocean. But that, they're, uh, they're algae eaters. They mostly feed on kelp. So you find them like in California and anywhere you find kelp, you're gonna find these big old sea hares. But it really took off, didn't it? I was wondering if it was alive for a second there. So cool. Okay, um, so that is a female blanket octopus. Ask me how I know. How do you know? Okay, well, I, I'm so glad, yeah. So, for one thing, it's got the blanket. Males don't have that. Females are also at least 10,000 times the size of the males. At least among organisms that large, I think it is the greatest amount of sexual dimorphism anywhere. And sometimes it's way more than 10,000 times. They're like, like the male is much smaller than a walnut and the female is several feet long. They are, and this scares me if they're ever in a Who Would Win book, uh, immune to the venom of man of wars. <laughs> and when they're young, or males all their life and young females, they will take the tentacles of man of wars and use them as weapons, both offensive and defensive weapons. Uh, so, you know, anyway, I suspect a man of war will probably kill them in a Who Would Win book. I want to say one thing before we wrap up. Last time in Unidentified Animal Identification, there was an animal that I identified as being a fossa, or if you want to pronounce it in a more Malagasy way, a fusa. Some people pointed out that it may be a jaguarundi, and I have spent a lot of time looking at it, and I don't know. I bet jaguarundis are seen more often, and the coloration seems more right for a jaguarundi, but the face shape doesn't, uh, seems more fossa-ish. And so you should totally check that video out and let me know your thoughts on that one because I'm still on the fence about it. But overall, that was a ton of fun. Should we do this again? And, and if we do, uh, what categories should we have? Uh, as always, like and subscribe. And we hope to see you real soon. Okay, hear me out. Okay. Imagine there's this amazing underground river that connects Scotland to this uh, this lake in Africa and so this is where Nessie goes this during is where the... Nessie vacations yeah when when the heat she snowbirds <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't even considered that
Why not? I don't know. You call yourself I a feel scientist. foolish. <laughs> no, 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 no. She flies. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Love it.